building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. presenter Malcolm Noble. Hello everyone, how are you? And thank you for being there. Welcome to the Talk Genealogy podcast, the monthly podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. Goodness me, we're up to episode 23, which means we've been doing this for, well, probably a good deal longer than we ought to have been. A special welcome to those new listeners who I know have uh, picked up on us on in recent months. You know, if each listener recommended this podcast to another enthusiast, we double our listening figures overnight. My goodness, so easy. This month, we're going to spend a few minutes looking at different ways of recording and presenting our work. On the one hand, this can feel like a rather straightforward subject hardly worth an episode to itself but hold on how many of us have learned through starting off with the wrong approach in fact i'd say it's quite unusual not to do five or six years research and decide you know what i could put this together in a far simpler way Which brings me to my usual caution that I'm neither a professional nor an expert. I'm an enthusiast like you who has spent far too many years digging up his family tree and these podcasts are really no more than me sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learnt along the way. What I'd like to do this evening is to look at the different formats for genealogies, recognising their different purposes and so the things we should consider when we think of using them, I'll also find time to suggest some other formats that you might want to sit alongside your printed genealogy. Now let me say from the start that I'm not recommending any particular computer software. I've tried so many and while I readily recognise that they suit some people, I've always come back to the basic text version of the genealogy as the core reference. I think it is important that we set out what we want our genealogical text to do, how we want it to look, and how we want people to handle it. If we later find a software option that fulfills these needs, fine, let's go for it. But I have always found myself having to make uncomfortable compromises, because the content and the shape of what's offered doesn't suit my research. Especially, I think it's important not to let any computer program direct the way that you fashion your genealogy. I do accept that computer programs make it easy to share, and I will come back to that later in this podcast. First, let us talk about the traditional pedigree, the crane's foot, the standard drawing of a family tree with one generation sitting along one staff. The advantages and usefulness of this design has meant that it has lasted for centuries virtually unchanged. You know, I have tried to find out when the first pedigree diagram was drawn, or at least the oldest to survive, but I've not been able to come up with anything. I'm sure the answer is well known and obvious, but it's certainly passed me by. So if you know, please let me know, and I'll pass it on, either on the website or in a future episode. Okay, back to the crane's foot. Its greatest plus is that even people who have no interest in genealogy can see at a glance what is going on, and this is so obviously the case that when pages of a history book are given over to pedigree charts, there is no need to offer explanations of how to use them. The disadvantage of this format is that it cannot hold much detailed information. So the pedigree chart or the traditional family tree is useful when we want to illustrate some point. The relationships within a marriage of cousins, the intertwining of two branches of the family tree, for example, or the incident of a particular profession. It is important that you decide what your chart is intended to show 
As I've said, the pedigree drawings are not suitable for showing every detail of your research. They can also be quite fun. I used a pedigree chart to show my remote, my very remote, relationship to William Shakespeare. It enabled me to remove all the unnecessary names and concentrate only on the thread up and down the different generations. As I say, it was only a bit of fun. In the same way, I have a floor-to-ceiling roll of my descent from Alfred the Great. Okay, some of the far-off links are, shall we say, traditional rather than proven, but it's still great fun illustrating the different pockets of English history as we climb up the wall. I suppose we most commonly use the pedigree chart in a rough hand when we want to start distilling or making sense of our research. But its main purpose is to illustrate. And it's worth taking some time over the pedigree chart, decorating it and annotating it. Use plenty of colour. And don't worry too much if you are no expert at calligraphy. Give the project some thought and you'll still end up with something to be proud of and something that interests other people. Here are a few guidelines that you might want to follow. Having decided the purpose of the chart, include that in the title, so everyone knows at a glance what they are looking for in the chart. Keep one generation, including cousins and in-laws, on the same level. You will be tempted to bend this rule, but as soon as you do, you weaken its impact. Remember, this is a format primarily for presentation, so let's not debilitate that. It follows that every child and every marriage need not be shown on the chart. Again, look at the purpose. The space allowed for each person should be deep rather than broad. And ask yourself how much detail is really necessary. Do you need to show in this illustration the dates of births, baptisms, marriages, deaths and burials? Or will the years of birth and death be enough? Remember, the main disadvantage of the pedigree chart is it cannot carry a great amount of detail. So let's turn that disadvantage into a positive. So, briefly, the pedigree chart is easily understood by everybody and has been tested over the centuries. So let's use it to illustrate and display snapshots of our family history. It is ideal for display, so major on that and display the evidence in an attractive and colourful way. A second type of chart is the ancestral chart, which shows only direct ancestors, two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on. Usually the generations proceed left to right, with yourself in column one, your parents in column two, one having the top half, the other having the bottom half. Usually we fit five generations on each sheet, so use a large enough paper. And that takes us up to our 16 great-great-grandparents. If we went to 32 great times threes, we would not have enough room to include the vital details for each individual. So, having reached the right-hand column, each ancestor in that column then occupies the first column of a set of new sheets. And so on. Some people adopt filling in one ancestral chart of five generations, fully annotated, as an early objective for their genealogical work, and it may be more of a challenge than you think. I am always using these charts to guide my research. For each individual, I have a separate space for the date and place of their birth, baptism, marriage, death, funeral and will. Now, if I do not have any of those details, they show up as a blank space staring at me, refusing to be ignored, reminding me that I need to discover this information. The charts also make it clear which ancestral lines have stalled and need some extra effort. Have you noticed how easy it is to ignore these stumps on the family tree because, well, the people don't seem interesting? 
the ancestral chart is a great reminder of what research needs doing. No, you cannot have an evening off. Now, yes, it is nice to carefully prepare a ancestral chart and post it to the family members. But I find that the charts I complete are working documents. So having designed a blank chart that suits you, you'll want to make sure that your design is readily available for printing. Now I've developed something of a bad habit. Because I use these charts so much, I often add notes on the back of the sheet about sources and blind alleys. Why is this a bad habit? It's a bad habit because I also like to lose the charts for some reason. They go missing and with them goes the search histories which I should have recorded in my research journal and on the card index, in your case probably a database. So don't do what I do. An alternative version of the ancestral chart is the fan chart. It is, not surprisingly, designed like a fan with each generation occupying the next in a series of expanding charts. Again, only direct ancestors are included. Now, I've never really understood the point of these. They have no advantage over the ancestral charts, and people who read them tend to pull funny faces as they try to work out what's going on. Perhaps they are there only so that magazines could offer them as free gifts. I'm posting this podcast on the 3rd of June 2018, and if you were listening a year ago, the latest podcast would be episode 11, Take Shakespeare for example. Let's just listen to a snatch of what was going on. Even respectable genealogists might have started jumping up and down with excitement, because John Shakespeare's wife was an Arden, and the Ardens of Warwickshire were one of the few families who could trace their pedigree back to the years before the conquest. And Shakespeare's story shows us how important it is for us to check the father-in-law's will. It will tell us about family relationships, their standing and wealth, but something else in this case. The phraseology of Robert Arden's will, and especially referring to the Virgin Mary, indicates a strong adherence to the old religion. And that is an important indication of his circumstances at the time, and a likely hint to young William's upbringing. And that podcast is still available through a link on the website talkgenealogy.blog. Regular listeners will know I'm a great Shakespeare fan when it comes to history and genealogy. Now, the formats we've discussed so far have been very good for presentation. And before moving on to more intense media, I want to give a few minutes to the presentation of a family's history in maps. Yes, we all refer to maps in our research. But I don't think maps get nearly enough attention when it comes to illustrating aspects of our family's past. Every library of a family's history should include an extensive atlas. At least that's what I think. Again, begin by settling on a purpose or subject. I've mentioned before the colleague who used information from the half tax returns of the 17th century to populate a map of her family's whereabouts during those years. She had added the location of a property dispute and the location of marriages and some deaths. The margins of the map are decorated with miniature family trees showing just two or three generations, as well as small sketches of local landmarks. Other maps you might want to do show migration patterns, especially from the countryside to the towns, field and property holdings, family distribution at particular points in history, the Civil War, the Plague, Victorian era, for example, and, of course, street maps to make sense of the census returns. Like a well-prepared pedigree chart, a carefully drawn map is always a good talking point. We now come to what might be thought of as the main document, the genealogy. 
building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Hey, I'm interrupting you. Before we get into that, I wonder if you'll just give me a couple of seconds just to slip in a trail for a brief series of alternative uh, podcasts which I'm posting. I've written a book, an account of over 300 pages, which deals with the outbreak of a plague in a Nottinghamshire village in 1604. And up to about half a dozen brief podcasts are there to support the book launch. Here we go with the trail. Your presenter, Malcolm Noble. Hello, everyone. I'm taking time out just to record a very short series of brief podcasts to support the release of my history about the plague in a Nottinghamshire village in 1604. Okay, these podcasts are going to be about 10 minutes each. I'll post them each Tuesday night and we'll leave them up for, I don't know, a couple of months, no more than that. Now, rather than tell the story of the plague from A to B, hey, that's in the book, I'm going to explore the background in a bit more detail and perhaps tag a particular thread to look at. Tonight, we're going to look at the Battle of East Stoke, sometimes called the Battle of Stoke Ford. In 1604, the Trentside village of Bleasby in Nottinghamshire was hit by the bubonic plague. It took off a hundred, give or take a soul or two, from a population that was, best guess, a touch over 300. The plague in Bleasby. A Nottinghamshire village survives its summer of death. You'll find out more about it at plagueinbleasby.com. Thank you for your patience, and now back to the regular edition of the Talk Genealogy podcast. By the way, this episode is being posted out of sequence. It's actually episode 27, posted on the 3rd of August. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. We now come to what might be thought of as the main document, the genealogy. I like to think of this as the family encyclopedia. Here... I mean the details of each member of the family shown in descent and produced in a consistent format of text. If you like, it is the book of the family tree written in words. It presents the whole picture, yes, but you will still need to divide it up. For many years I kept mine in four volumes, one for the ancestry of each grandparent. Now I have separated it further into six volumes, since some of those family branches do not come together until the turn of the 19th century, and they had previously come from very different districts. Within each volume, you will again want to divide the text into chapters. For example, when someone in one of the main lines marries someone with a separate and substantial genealogy, you may want to split that off into a separate chapter. A change of parish is also a good place for the start of a new chapter. Now, I do recommend that you start by picking up one or two printed genealogies and going through them. Work out what you find confusing, what you find helpful, and where the information is either disjointed or nicely put together. Are you always sure of what part of the family's history is set before you? Now, I'm always doing this, as much for relaxation as anything else. Oh yes, I can lose myself for hours in a meaty genealogy. But you know, I still come across good ideas which I later incorporate into my own genealogy. Regular listeners will know that I've been influenced by York Larry Wilson's Virginia Carolina genealogy. I've mentioned it many times before. And my format generally follows his. But compare that to the Plantagenet role of the Blood Royal, for example. And look at the printed Herald's visitations. And again, look at them critically. There is much that could have been done better. Now, before I go into detail, I want to offer just a couple of reminders. Firstly, you do need a printed paper copy. No matter how sophisticated a computer program, 
no matter how happy you are with it, no matter how many promises the software house makes, you still need a paper copy. We'd like your genealogy to be found in the bottom of a trunk in 60 years' time. By that time, every computer format that you could ever think of will be out of date. You need to provide future scholars with a paper copy. Now remember, this is not the narrative history of the family. It is important that the family story should be written up as a narrative, and we'll talk about that later in this podcast. But the genealogy is a vehicle for holding all the information. The genealogy is where you include every fact and detail. If in doubt, put it in. You are building the family encyclopedia. It follows that you must indicate where the details are probable facts rather than proven. For example, James, possibly a grocer in the High Street, 1866, and indicate the source. We'll talk about this citation of sources later on. The golden rule, be consistent. For example, you may decide to adopt your own system of giving each individual a reference number or no number at all. But whatever format you adopt must be the rule throughout the genealogy. And here I want to encourage you to resist using different fonts or styles for different types of information. It sounds useful, doesn't it? But it soon becomes too whizzy and it makes difficult reading. Sources. Again, I shall be offering some options later on. But the golden rule is that someone coming new to the project should be given enough information to follow up and check on your research. Our job is to help them as much as possible. So at least give them the source and where it can be found. Now if at any stage you decide to illustrate the genealogy with a pedigree chart, and that can be a good idea, make sure that the names can be easily related to individuals in the text of genealogy. Now, I'm going to go through how I built up my own text version quite slowly and in some detail. I hope this isn't going to be too tedious, but I suspect that most, if not all of you, will already have a version of your own, but by setting out the detail of different approaches, I'm hoping to spark some lively ideas for your project. So I hope you'll bear with me. This is not going to be sparky radio, I'm afraid. These volumes of your genealogy will never be complete. Hopefully, you will eventually hand them over to someone to continue the work. So make that easy for them. In the meantime, they need to be bound in a way that is, yes, secure and attractive to use and easy to use, but especially allows replacement pages to be put in place. After experimenting with many, many different options, I've settled on spring binders, the type often used as stamp albums. The whole of the spine is a spring grips the pages in place without damaging them. They are rather expensive compared with other products, especially since you'll need a series of them. So look around for discarded stamp albums. That's what I did and eventually came up with six matches. Ring binders, which snap shut and require holes punched in the margin, are the worst option, I think. You need to try things out. Now, for a start, take some time over the title of each volume. It needs to be specific rather than catchy. Volume 1 on my shelf is The Genealogy of My Paternal Grandfather, Charles Cecil Noble, 1887-1960. Beneath the title, I used to offer a list of key words, but I don't do that anymore. You then need to identify yourself and your address. Don't let this be like a photograph with no name or date on the back. And then the date of the latest version. You may want to offer a version number. I used to, but it meant nothing to other people, and it was easy to get it wrong, so I don't do it anymore. I am very careful about altering the date each time I make a revision. 
although this is not a narrative version, you may want to commence each volume with a simple statement of the context, probably no more than a couple of hundred words, explaining what the reader is going to find. So something like, this volume shows the descent from Barnabas the farmer who owned property in such a parish in the later Tudor period. After four generations in the village, one son went this way while the other son went that way. The grandson of the second branch from which we are descended moved to the industrial town in such and such a year and married so-and-so whose family had already been in the town for six generations. Her ancestry is found in chapter four and so on, or something like it. As a further preliminary, you will want to list abbreviations. Again, consistency is important, and something I consistently fail at. And a guide to how you have set out the genealogy and any conventions you have used. It may be useful to tell the reader what other volumes you have prepared, including the atlas and the narrative, so that they will know what books have gone missing. In the same spirit, whenever I come to write the text, I always use footnotes to detail where photographs, medals, furniture, letters relating to a particular person or event may be found. Somewhere, give the details of other people who are searching the same lines. Try and regard the genealogy as work you're doing for your great-great-grandchild. You want to give them as much help as possible and as many clues to follow up. TalkGenealogy.blog Here is the website that supports the monthly podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. You'll find links to previous episodes, a full list of books mentioned in the series, one or two details about other genealogy work I've done, and every now and then, though more then than now, a bit of a blog. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Okay, we're getting close to the nitty-gritty now, but not quite. <laughs> Some people begin with a list of ancestors in each generation. So, under a bold Roman numeral 3, we have four grandparents. The numeral 4, and we have eight great-grandparents. If you like, this is the ancestral chart converted into text. Now, this practice is very common in printed genealogies. So you may want to include it simply to follow convention, but I am at a loss to explain its practical use. Now let's talk about numbering each individual. I denote each direct ancestor by giving the Roman numeral of their generation, starting with my generation, as one. In other words, you subtract two from the numeral to indicate the number of greats in the relationship. But I'm indicating the generation, not the individual. I don't give a different reference number to each ancestor in that generation, and of course I don't give a reference number to siblings and cousins. My grandpa's wife is my grandma, so I put a generation number before her name. I know that other people come up with complicated ways of devising reference numbers for every individual in the genealogy. I just find that not only confusing, but also distracting. So, starting with the earliest ancestor in the line, I give the generation number and his name, then any variation in his name with dates. The place and dates of his birth, baptism, marriage license or bans, marriage, death, burial, and a reference to his will. Again, we need to be consistent in the order that we list these events. Follow these details with references to every time his name appears in any records, including trade directories, census returns, legal disputes, poll books, newspapers, and any time he signed as a witness. Then give the details of his different addresses or abodes, 
perhaps we know no more than his parish, and the dates for any evidence that he was living there. And in similar detail, account for his different trades and professions. Some details here will duplicate what you've already noted, but that's okay. It is here that you would detail any military service record. So, we have three paragraphs. His life details, his home, his work. Then give the fullest detail of any documented legal cases, any speeches, any press reports. One of my ancestors was called to swear a presentment or oath before a bishop. He'd been accused of being a wizard. Here is the place to give the text of that oath. And lastly, give the text and translation, if necessary, of his will. And here I just want to put in that if he leaves any bequests to others in the genealogy, that should be mentioned not only in the primary entry of the dead one, but also under the name of the living one. This personal biographical detail, what I call his primary entry, may be no more than a few lines, or it may extend for a few pages. Don't be shy of using up space. The genealogy is different from the pedigree chart. Here is the place to record every detail. In one instance, for example, the weekly payment of poor relief to an ancestor reached across several pages. While genealogies usually follow immediately with details of the spouse and the children, I like to make things clear with a simple statement. For example, Barnabas married twice, he had three children by his first wife and four by his second wife. My statement of his marriage reflects exactly what appears in either the record of the wedding or the licenses or the bans. So, giving the name of the bride and her address and status, the place and date of the wedding, the minister and any witnesses. I do not describe the bride as being the daughter of father and mother, unless this appears in the record. I include here any newspaper announcements about the wedding or the impending wedding. I then follow the same format as her husband, giving the life details, her life, her home, her work and the full details of any record that I have come across about her. Again, this description might be a long description, no matter. Then making it clear that this is a separate statement, I indicate the bride's place in the genealogy. For example, descended from so-and-so of generation 15. And I will indicate where the reader can find that descent. Sometimes I simply write follows. Then, by saying no more than had, I list the children, numbering them in sequence and giving full details. If the children, other than my direct ancestor, married and had children themselves, I would include those details here. If I want to record any descent to further generations of cousins, I indicate where this has been tabulated in the genealogy, and I find it quite easy to slip into inconsistency here, particularly if there is only one cousin in the third generation, for example. But it is important that the reader has confidence in the format we are following, so once again, consistency is the important factor. I would then repeat this process for any further marriages of the old ancestor. Now, if matters are straightforward, I list the children so that my direct ancestor comes last. So maybe I list the first child, then the third child and the fourth child, and then the second child lastly, if that is my direct ancestor. It is then easy to add his life details, followed by details of his marriage and the next generation. <laughs> Thank you.
any questions or comments, any ideas or suggestions, you can contact the podcast through the website talkgenealogy.blog or through the Facebook page. And there's Twitter, of course, on social media. Just search for Talk Genealogy. Now, before we go any further, I just need to double back on a couple of issues. When I number the children of a marriage, I simply say 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And I use the same numbers for children of other marriages. So I am only numbering children in the marriage. I'm not giving them an individual reference number. If I ever want to refer to an individual, I found it quite sufficient to give his name and the years of his birth and death. So James Noble, 1742-1796, and the page number or chapter number where his primary entry appears. If he is a direct ancestor, I would also give the generation number as the prefix in, in Roman numerals. Once I've given the detailed record of an ancestor's life, I do not repeat it every time the their name is mentioned. I simply give their year, date, generation number, and a simple direction of where to find them. Often, this is no more than see above, and it seems to work. More detailed cross-referencing may suit you. You need to try it out. You can see that by using this method, the genealogy descends neatly step by step. But you will need to find a natural break where you can add, for example, the genealogy of the bride, my great time something grandma, and the descent from your ancestors' siblings, the cousins, that is. The purest way to do this is to place this history immediately after the primary entry, that is, the first entry with all the recorded details. So after grandma's will, you would then note her ancestry and give the genealogy. The alternative is to wait until the direct line moves to another parish, or joins another large and largely documented family and introduce grandma's genealogy at that natural break. The first option, i.e. after the primary entry, is where readers would expect to find it if they are looking up any details. But this does disrupt the flow of the genealogy. The second option it's easier to read and follow, but may leave the reader who wants to find information quickly a little uncertain as to where to find it. Again, the most important thing is to be consistent. Remember, you can always use an abstract of a pedigree chart if you think this will help. I will discuss the citation of sources in a moment, but first a couple of points about footnotes and appendices. As already mentioned, I use footnotes to indicate where the current family is holding photographs, documents or property that once belonged to the ancestor. And then I give the contact details of those family members. I have wrestled and I have to admit to some inconsistency again as to where to record any family traditions or stories about the ancestor. Generally, I place them as a footnote if they are not supported by documentation. The trouble is that a letter or notes of an interview eventually might be thought as documented evidence. Sometimes letters in stories have crept into the main text, which I guess they ought not to. There are arguments on both sides, especially since a newspaper report may in fact be more inaccurate than any personal letter. Try to avoid resorting to appendices. I found that once I start adding things to the appendix rather than the text, I never stop, and I end up with a confusion of footnotes, cross-references, and disjointed sections. Also, remember there is a risk over years that the appendix may get separated. The, the appendix is perhaps best used for local history documents. Now the citation of sources. To emphasise, the purpose is to enable people who follow you to trace your work and check it for accuracy. It is important that every fact presented in the genealogy 
can be traced to its source. This can lead to a plethora of footnotes and more sources in brackets than your eyes can cope with. A section of references at the back of the genealogy which becomes so tatty through use that it gets separated. Truthfully, it is not an easy matter to settle. This is what I do. At the beginning of each line of descent in a particular parish, I state that all baptisms, marriages and burials are from the parish registers of the village and give the records office reference number. In the text, I then cite different registers, in brackets, if, for example, a marriage took place in a neighbouring parish. All other sources I include in brackets after the detail. I use abbreviations. Be careful always to give the date of the source. Then at the beginning of the volume, I list all the sources of where they can be found and, if possible, the dates I consulted them. I obviously also give the abbreviation that I use. Now this list will not be as long as you think. There may well be better ways of doing this, and I guess eventually we just have to settle on one that suits us. Again, it's a tension between including the detail and making the genealogy readable. Now, should you include an index? Hmm, probably. But remember that words are very searchable on word processors these days. And my own view is that compiling the index, even where your computer can help, is more trouble than it's worth. They are so easily inaccurate, filled with unintended duplication, and are likely to be very long. Now, partly this is a selfish point of view, since every name in the genealogy, and many that aren't, are in my MasterCard index, or in your case, on your database. Here's some earlier episodes of the podcast. Episode 15. Let's talk of graves, of worms, of epitaphs. Episode 13 was about the half tax. Episode 12, and it was Shakespeare, for example. Episode 9 discussed the medieval pipe rolls. Go to episode 7 for the companions of William the Conqueror. Episode 2, the herald's visitations. And our very first episode looked at working with Judah Wills. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. So now, the library of your family's history has several volumes of genealogy. The Family Encyclopedia. It has an atlas of hand-drawn maps and probably a few pedigree charts hanging on the wall. There will be a photograph section, I'm sure, and recordings of any oral history. So there will therefore be catalogues of each of those collections. There will also be books written by other people which mention your family. Details brought together in a bibliography of your family. Something that I found to be a really exciting project, another one of those projects that will probably never be completed. I think the bibliography is one of the truly neglected aspects of family history, and perhaps a subject, if not for a full episode, then at least a couple of minutes in the middle of one. But in the next section of tonight's podcast, I want to talk about the narrative history written by yourself. Now, not so many years ago, publishing a book on our family history was beyond most of us. The first problem, we were told, was that so few people would want to buy it. Now, this is still impractical for the full genealogy. It changes so frequently that you'd never be satisfied with it. The full genealogy is best shared in the easiest way. Simply email a copy to members of your family and promise them annual updates. After all, they don't have to open the attachment if they don't want to. Actually, you will receive a surprising level of interest. However, the process of self-publishing has now become so easy and frankly so cheap that it's probably not only the best but also the most efficient way of making more modest chunks of our work available to others. Writing the full history will be a massive task. How many volumes do you want to produce? And, hey, would you ever finish it? For professionally produced work, a more practical approach, I think, 
is to write a series of small books about subjects of interest to the family. So, the family history in a particular village, or a particular trade, a book of half a dozen colourful characters, or aspects of your family histories that has uh, grabbed your imagination. I recently published a book on a family of cricketers in my family tree. I had only a few copies printed, to a professional standard by a commercial printer, and I'm able to offer them at six ninety nine each, the regular price for comparable paperbacks. Self-publishing is fun these days, though hard work. But fortunately for you, it's beyond the scope of these podcasts, otherwise I'd go nattering on about it for hours. So, thank you for listening to episode 23 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. I hope it hasn't been too stodgy. Hey, I know that it has. Tonight we've looked especially at pedigree charts which are good for display, ancestral charts which can be worthy aids to research, and the full genealogy. I recommended spending some time with other printed genealogies and criticising them. I also gave away my liking and enthusiasm for the atlas of our family's history and the bibliography of the family history. Finally, I gave some initial pointers about publishing your narrative of different aspects of the story. I wonder if you have marked anything down on your things to do list, the family atlas perhaps, or making a start on the bibliography of your family's history. I really do hope you're going to have a go at that. If you've always shied away from starting on the main genealogy, perhaps I've given you something to begin with. And if you're halfway through, then maybe I've given you some ideas to consider when your next revamp is due. But perhaps you're not even that far. Perhaps you just want to nose around through some other printed genealogies to get used to the turf. Whatever you go for, I hope that you found something interesting in tonight's podcast. It's certainly been a little dry, hasn't it? Remember what Lord Grey said, this must be culture, because it sure ain't entertainment. My thanks to Emily Brooks for the voiceover, Freeze Effects for the music, and thank you to Joanna for suggesting the subject of tonight's podcast. If you'd like to catch up with previous episodes, the links are on the website, talkgenealogy.blog. The next episode will be our second anniversary, episode 24, which I will post on the 3rd of July 2018 at 7.30 UK time. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening. Good night and God bless. MalcolmNoble.com